Cool, great. Um, so we're prob probably going to kick off now. Um, I know some people are still going to be trickling in from the general session, but I figure it's better to start now and at least get the story kind of underway. So we're going to be talking to you today about um, building a true hybrid cloud with OpenStack and AWS, right? Um, and we're going to be using SkyTV as an example. Um, who have built out this platform uh, originally on AWS and decided to extend that out into OpenStack. And we'll be going into kind of why SkyTV have made that decision and some of the challenges and learnings that uh, we've made kind of through this journey. So um, just as in terms of introduction, my name's Nigel Wright. I work for a company called Dimension Data in New Zealand. Um, and I kind of look after their cloud technologies, um, their DevOps stream. And I've come to them from kind of a background of, uh, am I allowed to say HPE? Um, that was a bit of a dirty word um, sometimes, but that's my background, OpenStack background, cloud automation, um, and software, software development. And I'll hand over to JP now. Thanks, man. Yeah, like you said, JP, it's uh, Jean-Pierre Senegal. I'm infrastructure architect at um, Sky TV New Zealand. I'm afraid that my brain's still working on New Zealand time, so please just bear with me. Um, yeah, so we're just going to kick off, um, just give a bit of a background on why we decided to go, uh, or wh why we actually had to change, um, how we changed, and then we'll delve a bit deeper into the, um, the lessons learned category. So I'm not going to spend too much time on these slides because we've, we've all been bored to death with stuff like this. But connected personal devices, they've been growing at uh, almost an exponential rate. Um, we're currently in the billions, and they're looking at, you know, I think projected numbers are into the trillions in, uh, by 2030. What does that mean for a broadcaster like us? Well, it changes the whole landscape. Um, people are no longer just focused on one device to consume their content. It's all about having multiple devices. Um, so the way that they consume content have changed. If you then couple that with the fact that we will be disrupted, aka Netflix, we've um, pretty much got a good case to have to change. So let's start off. What did we do about it? We had to change. We knew we had to change. What did we do? First of all, we changed our technology vision. Now, there's a lot of buzzwords in there, broadcast quality with agility and an online speed of change. Basically, what that refers to is whatever you deliver, deliver it as a quality product within a short time frame and keep the momentum going by updating that, always well, always evolving the, the product. And this is, this is in reference to our whole technology stack. It's not just about applications. It's not just about platforms, infrastructure. It references the whole stack. We also had to define a few principles. Um, again, not going through all of these, because we'll touch on them as we go through the presentation. But some of these phrases were bandied about in meetings all over the place. Um, but it, was, it, it had to be done because we had to get the people to start understanding what does it mean, you know, what is cattle, cattle and pets, cattle versus pets. What does it mean if I say there's no humans in the cloud? We'll touch on that later. So we had to start building a capability. And being an enterprise company in, um, in New Zealand, uh, it was about 25 years old. Um, we, are very project, we used to be very project focused uh, with a waterfall delivery model. Um, we had to change that and become a bit more product focused with an agile delivery model and always keep the user experience within our sites. I don't like using the term customer centric. It just sounds weird. But yeah, keep the value and the user experience in our sites. And as we started gaining velocity through this transition, we were able to increase our capability models. So brings us to OpenStack and why are we here? We had the vision and we needed the mission. And that mission came in the form of the Olympic Games in 2016 in Rio. We were tasked with providing um, an OVP or an online video player um, for Olympic-based content. And we straight off the bat knew that our legacy system, which is called SkyGo, was just not going to cut the mustard. So the decision was made with the backing from our directors and our vision to provision, provision the OVP platform in, um, in the public cloud because we had to leverage their performance and scale, scaling capabilities, which we just didn't have on-prem. We did that 
through a well-architected manner as well, because we had to get buy-in from various stakeholders right from the start, and that included security being compliant. But with that and through, security, uh, through automation, we were able to deliver a product that was really performant, and we were able to, during the four weeks of the Olympic Games, do quite a bit of, of changes and um, without any interruption to the user experience. As you can see in the slide, we did 135 code changes, 40 prod deployments, and 176 pre-live redeployments. And that, that might not sound like huge numbers, right? But when you compare them to the, the other lines there, which is the delivery to their existing legacy model, those are huge, right? So you've only got a handful, one pre-live deployment, yeah. you know, a handful of production deployments, and only a tiny amount of code and config changes, right? So that means that their legacy environment just simply wasn't able to handle the amount of yeah. changes that, that needed to be made. So I really love that slide because it shows you that with you know, OpenStack and AWS together, and you know, everyone talks about hybrid cloud, but actually making it work and making it deliver something um, valuable is, is kind of harder to prove. So yeah. this really proves that. Yeah, I think the total changes for that legacy system was about seven changes in four weeks. So that was, we thought that was quite successful, and we wanted to get the same capabilities that we had in the public cloud on our private cloud as well. And like they said in the keynote this morning, someone mentioned it, you know, there's no cookie cut away or just a one size fits all. Um, so that's where OpenStack came in, because uh, it bridged, bridges a lot of the gaps for us. Um, OpenStack is, is located on our private cloud, um, running on infrastructure. We also on. Do I have a pointer on this or not? No, I don't think so. I've been okay. pointing at your eyes, trying to figure it out. Right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, on to 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 the right of the slide, um, our legacy systems applications running on on VMware. We decreased the footprint in that by redeploying it on hyperconvergent infrastructure, um, and then increasing our footprint on the OpenStack platform. And to the left, we've got public clouds now. We've got different use cases for public cloud integration. So we had to be agnostic in our approach. We couldn't just get sucked into one provider. Um, we had to be able to deploy the same stuff in, on, on multiple different clouds. And this is just a, an idea of that legacy SkyGo uh, application, how it's changed and evolved. It's actually a true hybrid application with a front end sitting in public cloud on AWS, an authorization stack which is bridging public and private, and it actually talks back to IDM and OED services, which is all on legacy systems, uh, internal on physical hardware. And over to you. Cool. So um, that's kind of a background of you know uh, an application that SkyTV have transformed to work in a hybrid model. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that have um, popped up in this journey. Uh, it, it certainly hasn't been completely seamless, and we didn't you know, click ne next, 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 and we've got OpenStack and AWS talking together, and everyone's happy. <laughs> Definitely not the case. And I should go forward instead of backwards. There we go. So the developers already had an existing pipeline. They already had um, processes in place and uh, a way to kind of deploy their code in AWS, right? And the problem with that is that there was no kind of architecture in place around those models. There was no um, planning done with sort of the wider business. The developers had a need, and they met that need, um, and the platform kind of just increased and increased and increased, right, with no regulation and no kind of yeah. planning and architecture. We like to refer to it as the Wild West. Um, and that's, I mean, that's great. They were able to do their jobs, and they were able to um, develop code, um, develop applications, develop products for Sky TV, but really need to start thinking more about how to manage that, right, because it needed to be managed. So we, we brought OpenStack on board and used that as an opportunity to start planning these things and d defining an architecture that could be used for both private cloud and public cloud, which was important. We didn't want to have a different process up in AWS and a different process in OpenStack, and then someone's using a different process in VMware down here. Definitely not the case. We want to make sure those were kind of standardized, and we used op the deployment of OpenStack to kind of do that and force that through the business, um, which worked quite well. The other key thing I want to touch on here is that we, need, we needed to minimize the amount of time taken to get OpenStack in production, right? And that, there's two parts to that. There's deploying OpenStack, and there's also making sure it's ready and fit for purpose for the workloads that the developers want to put on it. Um, so we, we handled that two different ways. So the, the deployment was done with the vendor. Um, we, we worked alongside HPE to actually get OpenStack in place. 
And we did that kind of in a you know, sprint-based um, approach, which was quite different for both HPE and for Sky's infrastructure team. And we're actually able to start getting OpenStack up and running you know, within a couple of weeks, and then fit for purpose for development workloads within about you know, four weeks or so, which was great. And that's fine for actually getting it stood up. But then we needed to figure out, OK, how do developers use the platform? How do they want to use the platform? What are they going to get out of it? What do they need to get out of it, right? Um, these are the things that still had to be kind of defined, and we had to do that very quickly. So the very first part of the whole implementation was around standing up the infrastructure and making sure it actually works. And then we had to go, OK, how do we make it work for developers? What do we need to do here? And it was really important at that stage to have those conversations with the developers and with the development team leads and bring them on board early as possible because I think it's pretty clear that without that buy-in, no one's going to use the platform. And I think I've seen it many times before when an enterprise comes in and goes, hey, we've got this amazing platform, and hey, it's developer first, and it's got an API, and please use it, please, please. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really work, right? You're trying to force people into a different model of working. So what we had to do is um, just make sure that it was fit for purpose for those developers. And as part of that, we, you know, we don't want to force tools, we don't want to force processes between the two clouds. I shouldn't hit my microphone, otherwise the sound guys are going to spank me. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we're using the right tools for the right job, right? The key thing that we needed to do was we needed to make it repeatable, easy to support, and make it fast, right? And the easy to support bit is kind of the most important bit, and that's why we went down the path of a vendor, just because we had kind of one throat to choke, and it was a lot easier to kind of get that done. So what I'll do is figure out how to use the pointer. <laughs> there we go. So um, this is the existing pipeline that the developers had in AWS. Um, so there's a few different components there. They were using the Atlassian suite, um, using Bitbucket and Bamboo. So basically, the developers would go through the normal process. You know, they'd develop code, they'd commit it, they'd merge it, um, pull requests would be issued. The Bamboo system would actually build the artifacts, so build a Java WAR file, store it in Artifactory. And Artifactory was backed by Amazon S3 buckets, right? And then what Bamboo would do is it would run a deployment plan, fantastic, and it would talk to code deploy. Code deploy would grab the binary, deploy it to the deployment group specified, um, all auto scaling groups, load balance, et cetera. Everybody's happy. You've got a highly available application in the cloud. That worked really well. Oh, I forgot. But <laughs> one day I'll figure this out. There we go. Ha <laughs> OpenStack, right? You see it looks exactly, well not exactly, but pretty much the same, and that's the end goal, right? We wanted to make sure that what we'd done with OpenStack didn't differ wildly from AWS, because otherwise it's gonna be a real pain in the ass for developers to get their head around you know, changing processes, and why would they use it? They've got a process that works in AWS. So the only things that are really different here is that um, we've, got, we've introduced an orchestration layer on top of everything, right? So you know, they, they check their code in, they commit it, pull request, Bamboo will still build the artifact as normal. Um, but then the deployment plan for Bamboo will actually talk to the overall orchestration layer that sits across the top of everything. So what that does is that actually goes out and checks that you know, the artifact exists locally, and that's where Swift storage comes in, because the key parts here is uh, Bitbucket, Bamboo, and Artifactory, they were all up in AWS, right? So what we don't want to do is every time we do a code build, we don't want to have to pull the artifact down from AWS and install it locally, because that's just stupid. So what we've done instead is check to see if the artifact exists in Swift for that particular project. If it doesn't exist, it'll pull it down and cache it. So it's now in the, in the local private cloud environment. Then that orchestration layer goes out and talks to Heat, which will actually stand up the instances required, deploy the software, software with um, software deployments and software config. And again, that's all auto-scaled, load balanced, the whole lot. So similar process, slightly different in that we have the overarching orchestration layer. Hey. Um, so then we have the final deployment pipeline. And you know it kind of makes sense. That's just a combination of the two, right? We've just joined them together. So effectively, Bamboo is the decision maker here. So we can decide whether or not it's going to be deployed to AWS, whether it's going to be deployed to OpenStack, or whether it's going to be an application that's going to be deployed to both. And that is an example, the um, SkyGo product architecture we showed you a couple of slides back with the authentication stack in OpenStack, front end in AWS, an example of that. So we can choose where, where it's going to go. And that kind of moves us on to some more of the, the challenges that we encountered. And the first one there is terminology. And it sounds like a really minor challenge. But it turned into an absolute nightmare. I'm sure JP can attest to this. In the beginning of the project, we were having conversations with, uh, with project management, with different parts of the, the organization, talking about OpenStack, talking about applications, products, projects. 
okay, great, so we talk about an open stack project and we stand up an open stack project. And then the project management office is going, oh, okay, how do we get involved in that? Like, what does that mean for us? So, okay, it's not that type of a, pro so we had to figure out how to change that language and make a kind of common model for a product, an application, deployment models, et cetera. So there was many, many meetings discussing what we were gonna call things and um, how we were gonna refer to them. So we just defined a product as the highest level and a product kind of corresponds to an OpenStack project, right? And that's how we kind of got away from that issue of weird terminology, meaning different things to different parts of the business. So we had to kind of map that out and model that out. So it's something we didn't expect to be an issue, but turned into kind of yeah. a big issue. And then we had to, that kind of flows on to the next point, which is kind of architecting OpenStack for applications in a way that's understood by the business, right? So that's where the terminology fit in. We had to make sure the business understood what we were trying to do, what an application looked like, and all the different components. Those two were tied quite closely together. And the key bit around that would be um, communication. So we had to make sure that we were talking to the business on a regular basis. We weren't an isolated group of you know, engineers and project resources going, okay, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, and then take it to the business who then say this is completely unworkable. Right? We need to make sure that they were involved at a very, very early state and often. Which leads us into the other issue that we had, uh, DNS. And this shouldn't be an issue, right? <laughs> but it is, unfortunately. So Sky TV have a um, unique kind of DNS set of requirements. Yep. Um, so there's no internal DNS server within the Sky TV environment. They're using public DNS, um, Route 53. And we hadn't really thought about how an app, a hybrid application living in OpenStack and AWS is gonna talk, how services are gonna discover each other, and how to make sure that the front-end services are talking to the right load balanced instances in OpenStack. Um, and we kind of took the approach of, okay, uh, she'll be right, which basically means we'll sort it out later, right? We'll sort it out later and everything will be fine. And uh, not fine, <laughs> definitely not fine. Um, so we have to end up doing things like, you know, host file hacks when we're doing deployments and running cloud init scripts to make sure that we're hard coding. It's just an absolute nightmare, right? And this issue is still ongoing. Um, I don't want to paint a picture that's completely rosy and everything's working and everything's 100%. No, it's still a problem that we have to address. So we're still kind of working through that yeah. challenge. Um, and then kind of brings us onto some of the other challenges and the other, the other areas of OpenStack, right? Networking challenges being quite, a, quite a, a hairy piece of the puzzle. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to solve the problem of, you know, we've got a lot of different projects being stood up and torn down at a, at a high rate. We wanted to, wanted to make sure that the networking wasn't held up by any of that. Um, so JP is probably going to best to talk about how they address some of those networking challenges. Yep. Um, Just throw that at you. <laughs> Cheers, man. <laughs> yeah, I think whenever, um, well, you can actually say that adoption of something new was really slow from the network team, and they were pushing back quite hard. Um, especially if you said the word SDN, they're just like, nah, we're not having that. And um, originally, you know, there was a bit of, of head butting and, you know, shouting over the table and all of that. But w once we realized that, uh, we actually thought of this, this analogy that about 10 years ago when um, computer and server virtualization started making, making grounds, um, the infrastructure and the server support guys, they were going through exactly the same thing. They were like, you know, there was some of them saying, man, this is awesome, this is like gonna change everything, it's so cool. And then you had another group that said, you know, now nah, this is witchcraft, it's never gonna take, um, we just, we're not even gonna look at it. So at least now we were in a position where we can look back at that experience and go like, hey guys, you know what? This is probably not going anywhere. We're gonna use it anyway, so better get on board. Um, someone once made a reference to, you can't be half pregnant, you need to be, you, you're either pregnant or you're not, and that's kind of the stance we took. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. And then, um, that's, I mean, right. that was one okay. of, the, yeah, cool. one of the, the big issues that we had around that. Um, the, the other bit is that, you know, we, and I, I touched on it just briefly before about, you know, the, how to handle the amount of networks that we're creating on the fly and talking to the network guys about this, and they're just absolutely freaking out, right? So the decision was made by one of the architects to um, use a slash 16 for external networks. 
um, which caused the network guys to have kittens. Um, oh, they, and security. And security. They were, they were not very happy about any of this because they didn't really understand the model, right, that we were trying to build. Mm -hmm. And the next slide's actually going to describe that, not that one, come oh, on, yeah. there we go. Um, and so what we've done there is we've just made, had to make them aware that, yes, we've got a slash 16 network, and yes, we have a lot of um, dynamic networks being stood up and provisioned on the fly, but they're all controlled, right? They're all controlled by the template. They're all controlled by the method and the methodology. So we had security groups in place. We had role-based <laughs> access for Neutron in place to make sure that only the instances that needed to talk to each other, that's it, and only on the required ports, one port ideally, um, so that they were kind of uh, made to feel a bit better about the whole situation because they could see that security is baked into the, into the template, into the model, into the infrastructure. And they kind of got away from um, the, okay, you know, slash 16, we'll, we'll deal with that, that's fine. Yeah, so I can just touch on that. Yeah. With, with, within a, an, an environment, um, you've got a dev stack, a test stack, pre-live stack, and a prod stack, and they can be multiple stacks as well. So what we ended up doing was using um, knuckles to separate the stacks so that Dev can't see test, test can't see pre-live, pre-live can't see prod. And then we also had security groups for the, because we just used a um, normal 3T architecture, application architecture. So we were using security groups to allow communication from the web to the logic to the data layers. Yeah, and that's how we kind of got past that issue with the network team. Mm. Not really an issue, slight challenge. A slight challenge. A slight concern. Yeah. <laughs> cool, and there we go. So that led us to another of the challenges, right? So SDN, SDN's easy, yay, piece of cake. Next, next, and you've got, you've got virtual networking, right? No, it's definitely not the case. We had a pretty unique problem at Sky TV where um, there was a requirement to have software-defined networking across the entire environment, virtual and physical. So they decided to go with Cisco ACI to do that, which is great, you know, great SDN engine to, to handle that capability. Yep. And so they'd gone through at roughly the same time an implementation of ACI, learning how to use software-defined networking. And then we go, hey, OpenStack, Neutron, whoop. and they had to learn two SDN engines. Look, there was some pushback around that to say, why do we have two engines? What's gonna drive what? Is there any integration points between the two? So we were running in a pretty strange environment with two SDN engines being installed at the same time and yeah. a network team who had to suddenly learn the differences between the two, where to use what, where the integration points were, right? And that was hard. That was very, very difficult. And a problem that we have, and it's still a problem now, because there are still problems, um, is that the integration between ACI and Neutron still isn't done. And now we're sort of kind of moving very, very close to production, and that becomes harder and harder and harder as you get workloads in place, right? Working backwards, untangling a mess, and kind of re-architecting. Re yeah. That was very difficult, and I think the, the key takeaway from that is Maybe don't do that. <laughs> and, and education was really key because yes. the- Education the, is key, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. The networking team were, to be fair, they were left out of some of the conversations that we were having at a very early stage um, and left out of maybe some education sessions that they should have been involved with. And that's, that's something we took away as a, as yep. a lesson learned. Yep. Uh, if we could do it again, they would be in the door from day one and maybe we'd space out the two SCN engines. A little Everyone bit. would be and we'd be one happy family. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, I'm just gonna move relatively quickly through these. Um, brings us on to operational challenges, because we've solved the technology, and now we need to figure out how to actually run it in, in production or close to production. So we had, we've talked about you know, the code pipeline and developers and developers and developers and developers, and that's great, but there's, an, there's a whole other part of the business, right? And they do have a requirement to use some of the capabilities of OpenStack and of hybrid cloud. So we had to figure out a way that we could deploy this hybrid cloud, make it easy to use for both developers and for the rest of the business. So what we had to do is, is identify a way that the rest of the business would use the platform, how they consume workloads. And so we've decided upon a self-service kind of portal layer so that they can log into a website, spin up instances for testing, spin up instances for you know, general kind of hacking around if they want to see how a new flavor of Linux works or they want to install Windows or, or what have you. And that was, that's us taking care of the rest of the business. So we've gone, okay, you can use this platform as well. It's not just this shiny thing we've put in for developers and you know, the rest of the business has to go down to the coal mines and use VMware. Definitely not the case. Um, and the other part of that is the developers and we've kind of, we've catered to them pretty well. So we've 
we've integrated it into the code pipeline. We've made sure everything's API, API first, API friendly, and that's the way that things should be consumed. So that's kind of taking care of how we handle those two requirements. And let JP talk about some of the other operational challenges oh, yeah. around building a team. Um, I'm quite aware of the time, so I'm going to fly through this. Building, building the, the team. So it, it was quite clear right from the start that we will not be getting any headcount or we will not be able to stand up another team, which in hindsight is quite a good thing because at the end of it, one of the benefits that we had from what we were doing was that um, we were breaking down silos and we didn't even realize it. But I'll get to that now. Um, yeah, so because we couldn't do that, we had to revert to using virtual teams. And to get a virtual team up and running, um, we kind of had to look at, at how do you pick people to become a part of a team? And that's where a attitude was chosen over aptitude. So we didn't necessarily take the best people in um, skill-wise and, and, and certified-wise. We took the people that had the attitude, that drank the Kool-Aid pretty much, that had the buy-in, that believed in what we were trying to do right from the start. And because we were doing this in, ag in an agile delivery method, we pretty much had two-week sprints. So we could, well, from a lot of goodwill from the managers as well, we could take a resource from a team and run through a sprint. Um, and at the end of the day, it kind of looked like we had this, I don't know, this Cloud Ninja Cloud Ops team, because it was made up of people from different resources from different teams, infrastructure, network security, developers, products. People would come in and go out, you know, not always the same people. Um, but this turned out pretty well. And this is actually now our, our operational model as well for, for support. Um, and like I said, you know, one of the key benefits and takeaways from this was we were able to break down silos between teams because people were kind of forced to work together. Yeah, cool. So we've built a team. Um, we've figured out how people, the different personas involved. And now we need to figure out how do people actually use the platform. There's a ton of different ways you can interact with OpenStack, obviously. So CLI, API, you can log into Horizon. You can, you can do what you need to do. But we need to make sure that the way people are accessing it was the right way, right? It was, it was the right way for their particular persona. We didn't want people just all logging into Horizon, spinning up instances, and, and just going for it. Mm. Um, nor did we want kind of unrestricted access to the API and people could do what they want. So it kind of goes back to the, um, the principles that, that JP defined earlier, not the rise of cloud alts, but no humans in the cloud, right? We didn't want people logging in, doing tweaks, standing up things, and you know, oh, this instance doesn't work quite right, so let's log into it and make a little change here that's not really that, that yeah. recorded. Um, so what we decided to do is um, access to Horizon was only allowed by the Cloud Ops team, so a very, very small amount, um, a small virtual team. And that was kind of, it was strongly recommended to them that they use that as a sort of last approach, right? If there was something that they absolutely had to do in Horizon, sure, log in and do that. But generally, we were trying to move them away from that and trying to move into kind of an automated world so they could, you know, they could run playbooks, they could use Terraform, they could do anything they needed to do to kind of stand up and tear down instances. We wanted to make sure that the workload creation was only done through orchestration and through API. And there's, got, there's obviously some exceptions to that because not everything could be done that way. Um, so we did, when you're standing up a new environment, maybe you need to check how, you know, how to lay out the networking, how to stand up servers, how to configure them. So maybe you'd log into Horizon and do that, build a template, and that's it. You wouldn't get back in again. Hmm. What we wanted to also do was make sure every instance that's created has meaningful metadata attached to it so we know exactly why it's been created and what purpose it's serving, right? Because it's a private cloud, the OpenStack part of it uses, uses resources. We need to know what's using resources and why. So every time instances were created, they were tagged with metadata for you know, the scaling group, um, the application that's being deployed, the project, all, all the useful information to look at an instance and go, this is exactly what it's used for. And it was easy on the flip side of that to go, OK, let's have a look at all the instances that are created that don't have metadata. And we can, you know, we can point the dev killer at them and destroy all those instances if we need to, which is just a script. Just sounds more impressive when you call it the dev killer. But um, it's easy to actually pull that data out and go, okay, there's some instances here that shouldn't be here, and we can we can get rid of them and free up those resources. And the outcome of that is that the platform is actually being used as intended. Developers are using it, hitting the APIs only. Hardly anyone's logging into Horizon. Everything's done via an automated fashion um, through the self-service and the orchestration layer. And that works for applications. And so I'm just going to touch really quickly on the last 
um, sort of challenge that we hit, which was automation. And that's a very, very common problem, right? Automating. There's so many tools out there, so many different purposes, and we talk to a lot of people about automation. They spit out the automation um, prayer or sentence or whatever, you know, Ansible Salt, Chef at Pub Salt. <laughs> so, okay, is that one product? Is that, <laughs> is that five products? Um, so you, we needed to break down all the different automation tools into their roles and go, okay, what do we want to do? We want to stand up instances. What should we use that? What should we use to do that? What do we want to do? We want to ensure configuration is consistent across all the instances. What should we do to make sure that happens? So it's all about choosing the right tool for the right job. And in doing that, sure, you might have three or four different automation technologies in place, but by having an automation, an orchestration layer across the top of that, essentially acting as an API gateway, you can control the rest of those, of all those automation technologies in quite a granular fashion and make sure that if you want to spin up an instance, maybe use Terraform. If you want to deploy some software, you could use Ansible, et cetera. So we tried to make that as logical and rational as possible by layering that orchestration engine over the top of everything else so that we can add new tools in if we need to because it's easy to extend the orchestration layer out. Um, and that's kind of the, the automation challenge that we had, right tool for the right job. And I'll just finish up by actually, what does success mean? Did we succeed with this project? Um, and the slide says, what does fast look like? And that doesn't look really fast. But um, the key takeaway from this is this is one of the projects that we had the internal part of the hybrid application, the SkyGo application. Um, and in the past, to stand up this environment in AWS, had to go through security, had to go through change control, had to go through design meetings, had to be signed off by the business, mm -hmm. then actually had to be stood up and made sure it was stood up correctly. And that process took about six weeks to go through. And what we've done and what we demonstrated to the, um, to the Sky team is deploying that project in three minutes and 20 seconds. Everything, security's in the template. Change management's in the template. You do the template once, you get that approved, signed off, you don't really need to go through change control again. Yeah. So that was a huge, just game changer for Sky TV. I know that everyone talks about big numbers, big number here, small number here, but this mm. is something that um, actually took six weeks to do and now yeah. only takes three minutes and is a pretty pretty great outcome, I think, for I, a hybrid application. Yeah, like I, how, how do you change the direction of an oil tank? It's not going to happen fast, but this was this was definitely something that helped. Yeah. So that's um, really all we had to talk to you about. Um, success. Yes. Go. Questions? I don't think we've got time for many, but. I think that um, it's a bit of both. So we, we always try to not change the, the way that the developers used to work, but we also had the, the, the fact that we've got some DevOps guys who were trying to kind of figure out where do they actually fit into this because who's going to spin up the servers? Is it going to be the infrastructure guys who's doing the templates? You know, So there was, there was a bit of that to and fro, but there's a, a much better understanding of what needs to happen and who should be looking after what after four sprints. So yeah, there's, there's, I don't think that the way that they work has changed at all that much. And just to, just to add on that, the, um, the way we approached it was a, little, was a little bit clever as well because we got the developer involved, well, one of the developers from the team involved and he saw the value of it, was working really closely with us and then we got his team leader involved, demonstrated this to him and then he could see it, right? He understood how this worked and then that, would, that goodwill kind of means that it's easier now to get more resources from his team. So we had to make sure that, but back to the, the, the concept of building the team, make sure people are drinking the Kool-Aid. You want those people who are going to be talking about it, yep. telling everyone they meet about it, this is great, and then they can tell their manager, the manager gets information, show them more resources yep. from that team. So it kind of worked out quite nicely. It did, and word spread as well. Like, you know, you're walking down the hallway and people would come up to you and just say like, hey man, what's CloudOps about? You know, I want to know more about this. I want, I want to get involved. So. It's, I think we, we started with a group of about four or five people initially, and now in our weekly meetings, you know, it's up to about 20, 25 people. So it's, it's, good, it's good in that respect. Yeah, cool. Oh, uh, yeah. Which distribution do you use? And I saw you mention as well as HP there. They were only there with the OO, or they were also with their so, Yeah, so it was HP, Helium, OpenStack. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, Sort of. It was, it was 
it was Healy and OpenStack, and it was the operations orchestration layer for, for the automation. So we just used those two pieces, really. Um, and the reason that was done was due to support, right? It's, it was a lot easier for us to get support from a vendor like HPE than it was to figure out um, who's going to solve the issues mm. from upstream. Okay. Yeah. So that was basically the main reason, just get the support from HPE and... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hard to sell OpenStack to an enterprise. Yeah. Just get the backing. <laughs> Just yep. a quick technical yep. reminder. Could you just we repeat done. the questions that people are asking for the people listening remotely? Sorry, what was that? Just repeat the questions that the audience uh, are oh, asking right. so yep. people can hear okay, remotely. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, sure. Hi. Oh, microphone. Yes. <laughs> so you mentioned there are lots of challenges in making uh, ACI and Neutron working together, and your suggestion is probably not to do it. Oh, so no, 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 no. That, that, that's <laughs> definitely not, not, not the suggestion is... That's not the answer. No. Um, what, what I was trying to say um, around the integration points with ACI and Neutron is that we needed to know what those points were. Um, and we didn't know what that was. And the idea is that we should have integrated Cisco. We sort of installed Cisco ACI, made sure the networking team knew what they were doing with SDN, yes. which, they, which they do now, which is great. And then when we introduced OpenStack to the mix, made sure that they understood what Neutron was for, and then understood how the two talk, talk together and work together. So definitely, it wasn't a don't, don't ever integrate the mm. two, because I think it's a fantastic integration. It was just how do we do that, yep. and which points do we use? Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Oh. Did you guys think about the front end for all the integration between AWS and OpenStack and what it means for the rest of the company, not the DevOps that's going to use mm -hmm. the system? Yeah, so the, the front end, kind of question, that was, that was a, a part that we didn't really show in the, in the slides, but we had a, a self-service platform in, in place for that, so it was all catalog driven, so that people could log in with their normal AD credentials to a shopping cart kind of experience and go, I want to stand up a server, or I want to deploy an application, or I want to deploy a service. We made it so that it was super simple for them to do, right? Not saying the rest of the business were idiots, because that's definitely not the case, but you, you want a nice shiny UI, really, at the end of the day to start spinning these things up and make it easy for people. Otherwise, they're not going to use it. Yeah. So that's how we handled that, that rest of the business kind of problem. Cool. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much for your time, guys. That's us. Cheers. Thanks, guys.